So uh, as Anna said, I work at Penn State University, but I just want you to know that Penn State University does not support any IPM work. All of our work is done by uh, independent grant funding. So we'll see how long this lasts. So far, so good, but we'll see. Um, I am trained as an entomologist, so I may have to apologize for bursting out into entomological details from time to time. And the, one of the main challenges in talking about IPM to any group, which as Anna mentioned has been many, I've spoken to just about any kind of group you might imagine, is that really what people want to know is, ooh, ooh, how do I get rid of bed bugs? Or ooh, ooh, how do I get rid of ants? So one thing about this topic is good is as a, it's of personal interest to everybody. So when I speak about these things, I kind of speak in a, in a very holistic manner. I speak to you as an individual, you as an administrator of programs, you as a teacher, you as a health professional, but also you as somebody who lives somewhere. And I'm willing to bet that every person in this room would raise their hand if I asked, have you ever had a pest problem? And everybody would raise their hand. And what did you do? And where was the information source that you went to to try to find information? And if the answer is like, gee, I don't know, that's a problem right there. It's a pervasive problem. Who are you going to ask if you want to know certain things? So now things are quite a bit better than they used to be uh, with all of these great people working on IPM as part of indoor air quality. So we have a ton of great tools, which before I even get started, um, I want to mention that I have a resource uh, list that is on your, uh, your thumb drive, your flash drive. But I also have that list with me that I'm going to pass around on two sides of the room. <clears throat> the reason for that is when you go home with those flash drives, if you're anything like me, you may excavate them sometime in the next five years. Oh, what is this? Oh, yeah, that's great. Okay. <laughs> so I want you to know this is a three-page annotated. I've done this work for 20 years. It's an annotated list by area of concern. So if you've got child care, there's a list for you. If there's schools, a list for you. If you're a building manager, a list for you. If you're, you know, whatever all it says on here, there's a list for you. So uh, this list is on your uh, flash drive, and it has hot links on it. So I'm going to pass them this way, along with the obligatory vial of bed bugs. These are bed bugs uh, embedded in hand sanitizer, which turns out to be an excellent way to be able to display them. The first thing about most insect issues is to accurately identify the pest. If you don't know the problem, your likelihood of taking the right actions are very remote. We've had, because bed bugs are causing hysteria, all kinds of things are being accused of being bed bugs, and therefore we're going to nuke the place just in case. <laughs> right? So uh, this is obligatory for us, those of us who work as entomologists in this field. So one's going to go that way, and one's going to go this way. Anna, could you? Oh, somebody, take it over there. <laughs> Thank you. All right. At the back, there are some fact sheets, um, including... Uh, urban pests, something from Better Kid Care, which has some online modules on IPM for child care centers for which you can get credit in any state at a cost of a whopping $5. Pick these up. And then some of our fact sheets, uh, asthma, pests, and pesticides, and got bugs. The got bug series have ants, mice, bed bugs, head lice, all that kind of stuff in it, and it's like digestible. This is the whole thing right here. All right, so pick those up. I do not want to take them with me. All right. Okay, uh, and before I get started, one last thing. I want to thank Jerry uh, and his team so much for inviting us, our IPM team, to speak here because we don't often get to speak to such a friendly audience. You know, you guys are already more than halfway there, so it's really great to have this kind of thoughtful and committed audience to, to speak to, so I'm really grateful to be here. All right, now, uh, I'm sort of one of these speakers like I never know exactly what I'm going to say till I say it. Um, so I had to put this, this talk in last week. For me, that's an anathema to my way of performing. My way of performing is the night before, quickly put stuff together and say, okay, now I'm in the groove, right? So I have a lot of slides and I'm going to try to get through most of them. If I don't, it won't matter because the ones at the end are the sort of list of things. You know, eight steps to starting your IPM program. Those kind of lists are everywhere. Right? So if we somehow get like, okay, now I can't look at one more slide with a list on it, you don't have to worry about it because it's in, the, in there, in the, uh, excuse me, in your little thumb thing. And um, so we'll just go from there. If I can figure out how to work this thing. Uh, push a button, I take it. There you go. <laughs> 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 wow! 
I'm finished. <laughs> that was the easiest talk I ever gave. I probably like blew the whole thing up. This is what happens to me. The Luddite. Let's touch this one. Uh, this one? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. All right. So this is a general overview of what I hope to cover. It's very general. Uh, pest management is really different from some of these other uh, environmental health topics that we've talked about for a bunch of reasons. And I'm going to talk about why. Then I'm going to talk about what is IPM, just in very generic terms. It's not rocket science. You all know most of it probably already, but still. Why is it that IPM is a solution to some of these risk, um, risk scenarios? Some challenges to IPM implementation. Now, I know we've all heard about challenges here. You know, there's no money, there's no this, there's no that. Uh, the challenges to IPM implementation are mostly people. They're mostly attitudinal. And we can do IPM, and it doesn't take a lot of money. Okay, so that's a good thing about it. Uh, the bad thing about it is that we need a psychologist, but, you know. And then what implementing IPM, what are your action items? The action items can be the same. It, uh, the buildings vary. So I'm not going to speak specifically about a medical building. I probably will refer quite a bit to child cares and schools because that's what we've been working on lately. And the resources are what I just gave you. Uh, look at that and say, oh, yeah, I better check this out. Um, all right. Uh, many of you may have seen this graphic before. Um, the Healthy Homes, the National Center for Healthy Housing does a program on healthy homes with many uh, variables that they do. They talk about the key things that dictates whether you're going to have good indoor air quality. And we concentrate on our program on the, on the final two. Uh, contaminant free, which we've all talked about, radon, lead, blah, 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 all this stuff. And uh, pest free. But the trouble is, is that when you have pests, the way you get rid of them is use a contaminant i.e. a pesticide. That's SOP, Standard Operating Procedure. So there's an inherent uh, problem there. So these are some of these unique programs, uh, unique aspects. Uh, the, targeted the targeted hazard is a pest, which is really different from lead, let's say, in a number of ways, uh, which I'll get to. Uh, the aspects of the tools that are used to remediate lead is really different than the t tools we use to remediate pests, which we use pesticides, which are themselves toxic. And then aspects of the key players. Like say with lead, you know who the remediators are, you know how to get them, there's money to do it, they know what to do, they do it, and then it's done. Whereas with pests, it happens over and over again and there's a lot of people involved. We've seen a little bit of that in just in the conversations in this room today. Well, what if, who's, who's in charge, who's on first, who's supposed to do what? Um, and then Finally, we have this aspects of the regulatory framework around pesticides, which is extremely complex and some would say Byzantine, I would say, uh, but I'm not going to get into that because that's a whole other talk. Um, so the main thing that's different is that pests are actually alive and they reproduce, unlike lead or radon or any of those things. Um, they're alive and they reproduce. And as such, they move around, <coughs> excuse me, they're an ongoing problem. They ebb, they wane, they move around, they go different places, and they occupy the building the way they would occupy any ecological space. This is my home, and I'm going to move around in it and find all the places that are, you know, uh, allowing me to live well. So building-wide efforts are needed, even though we fight it as individuals. I know it's something about our society, you know, we got to do it individually, but we need the whole building to, uh, to be involved. They actively respond and adapt to events. You do one thing and they go someplace else. Uh, or you try one thing and it doesn't work and it gets worse. So they're, they're constantly, there's this feedback loop um, that makes it different from, say, lead or radon. Uh, there's a social stigma attached to pests. Nobody says, oh my god, you had lead? <gasps> <laughs> or you would admit, like, oh, we had lead and, you know, I got so-and-so to take care of it. You're not going to say, oh, I got cockroaches and, you know, like, you do. You're right. People are not going to admit to this, which creates a barrier, uh, makes it different from uh, other kind of dealing with other hazards, and they elicit strong emotional responses, which you know, along the same vein. So uh, you see where I'm going with this: the sort of psychological, cultural uh, parts about dealing with uh, pests. Plus, what is a pest? We know what radon is. We know what lead is. But what's a pest? Well, you can give this generic definition: it's something in a place where we don't want it. But as a biologist in training, look at what we have here. We have like the entire spectrum of the biological world. 
Each one of those things has a different strategy for quote unquote managing it if it's in a place we don't want it. So dealing with bats is really different from dealing with bed bugs. Who are you gonna call? Who are you gonna call? Who do people call? You know who they call. Uh, I have very few slides on problems caused by pests. The reason for that is I don't have to convince anybody that you want to get rid of pests. That's done. That's already there, okay? So yes, they cause health issues. They can bite or sting. So like a wasp nest above a door is a much higher priority than a wasp nest out on the tree in the back 40, okay? They may spread bacterial viral diseases. They contaminate food and they trigger asthma. And the asthma trigger thing is huge. And I don't know if Francine is still here. Where are you? Are you here? Um, at the school district in, in Philadelphia, we have a you know, partnership going. We work a lot with Francine and her people on an asthma initiative there. And frankly, I have to say, just for a shout out to her, even though she's not here, they're doing a fabulous job. Before Francine was there, you couldn't get anybody to answer your call. She's very proactive on this asthma thing and pest thing. <clears throat> okay, now we got the pesticides piece. What makes them different from other contaminants? Well, first of all, out of all those 84,000 chemicals, whoever we were talking about earlier, these are made on purpose to be toxic. The reason the pesticide exists is to be, to kill something, to be uh, toxic to some biological function in the living world. So that makes them different. They also include a wide variety of toxicants. Again, it's not just like lead. We have 700 different kinds of active ingredients created on purpose to be toxic that are mixed into pesticides. So there's a lot of them. What do you have to know to understand what to do in case of poisoning? You have to know something about what kind is it out of 700 kinds. Uh, use of a pesticide indoors is de facto contamination of the indoor environment. De facto. How do you use a pesticide without contaminating the environment? What does it mean to use a pesticide? It means to spread it broadly in the environment, generally speaking, in standard operating procedures. Uh, they have been used indoors and in most housing and building environments <clears throat> for decades, repeatedly. What's a pest control operator? Oh, he comes once a month and sprays for bugs. Do you have any bugs? Well, I don't know, I don't see any because he comes once a month and sprays for bugs. <laughs> That's SOP, my friends. Multiple pesticide residues exist indoors. Increasingly, there's good data on this. You know, this is something you can intimate that would be true, given the previous things. But now we're getting lots of good data, uh, the fact that there is a lot of these residues indoors. And the residues are much higher inside than outside, at least five times, sometimes more. Okay, so what is a pesticide anyhow? Side means to kill, so, you know, homicide, pesticide. So pesticide kills different kinds of pests, rodenticides, insecticides, herbicides, algicides, and of course, the antimicrobials that got spoken about earlier is also technically a pesticide. Uh, a lot of times in common parlance, you can't even use the term pesticide in many of the environments we work in because nobody knows what you're talking about. You have to say bug spray. You have to say weed killer. I'm not, you laugh. Talk about communicating. Talk about communicating with your population who needs to understand what you're saying. You can't, it's not even talking down to, it's like being aware of their worldview and where they live and what solutions they've come to and their, what's their cultural knowledge of these things. So um, a lot of times uh, pesticide and insecticide are used almost uh, uh, interchangeably, which, in which isn't true. I will speak a lot about insecticides on purpose because people are more afraid of insects than they're afraid of weeds. And insecticides tend to be way more acutely toxic and probably chronically toxic than herbicides. <clears throat> so I will talk about insecticides quite a bit. Uh, the Poison Control Center, this is, this is not the most current, but the pattern is always the same. Uh, I should say always. Ever since they've started doing this, the pattern has remained the same. The top five acute exposures, the calls that come in for kids under five years old, you see number two is household chemicals. So that green cleaning thing, it's real. It's a good idea. And uh, then it goes on down. And then usually around 8, 9, or 10 are pesticides. So the acute exposure of kids to pesticides in that particular time frame was 44,644. Uh, most of them are rodenticides and insecticides. And that's because, well, I'll just, I'm extrapolating here, but it's because every house has them. 
and every house stores them under the sink, or at least not under lock and key. The rodenticides typically until recently have been little pelleted baits that kids can easily put in their mouth. And it took 20 years of this exact same data to get EPA to change the rule, and then the companies won't comply. That's a very interesting situation. All right, uh, then there's the chronic pesticide exposure, the fact that pesticides are ubiquitous. We already went through this, 84,000 industrial chemicals out there and uh, 700 pesticide active ingredients. Now the active is just the part that's supposed to be toxic, but a pesticide itself is mixed in a formulated, so-called formulated product. That formulated product has some combination of 20,000 so-called inert ingredients. Those inert ingredients are just called inert because that's what, well, I don't know why they chose it, not to be too cynical, but they're not necessarily physiologically inert. They're just called inerts because they're not the active. So I am not a mathematician by any stretch, but you do that thing that you had to do in high school with combinations, 700 actives times 20,000 form, you know, different inerts. So. Uh, total use of pesticide in the United States is estimated at 1.2 billion pounds of active ingredient. You consider that per year, you consider that uh, each pesticide has maybe between 1 to 10 percent active ingredient and the rest is this other inert stuff all mixed in. That's a lot of product. Most of it's outdoor, uh, but we lack data on structural indoor pesticide use. The, the indications from New York City who which has some good data, and San Francisco has some good data also, is that the use is very large in indoor environments and in, in residential places. So here we see just sort of uh, how ubiquitous this is in the outside environment. And I combined a couple different charts here. Uh, the USGS does water samples and they found pesticide detects course all over everywhere in all the streams so the fact that you can put this out in the environment in this way and not have it end up you know in our ecological system and in our bodies is you know it's silly to think that that would be the case uh, this is just some of the data from New York City um, this data I'm not putting this here to say oh wow look how much pesticide they use in fact New York City has a uh, local law that has instructed them to use IPM, and this is just the agency pesticides that are used, used by agencies in New York City. They estimate that this is only less than 2% of the total commercial use of pesticides in the city. And this is formulated product, it's not the active. So in any case, you can kind of see it's a lot. New York City's a big place, but this is just agency. It's not other commercial and it's not individual private residents. Uh, and an expose, I guess you could call it back when Spitzer was doing his thing there. Not that thing, the other thing. <laughs> when he was being the AG, uh, you know, he commissioned a study in New York City showing that uh, residential use of over-the-counter pesticides in New York City was sometimes up to, uh, multi it was 30% of people use them more than once a week. And that would be like foggers and things like that. That was a lot. All right, so blah, 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 a lot of people use pesticides. All right. But this one is a nice one. It's a combination of the American Healthy Homes study, which is in black, the histogram, and the daycare study that Nicole Tulve did back in the early 2000s. And what it shows is the detection frequency of pesticide active ingredients in homes and daycares. And um, Dan Stout from the AHHS study put this together, which I like because back to that, that statistic about how much time people and kids in specific spend indoors, where are they? They're either at home or at school in the, or in daycares. And if you look at these, they mirror each other, especially the permethrins, the two down there next to PBO. Those are, that's a very, very common active ingredient in most pesticides today. When they took the, some of the hotter, hotter ones off the market, they just substituted permethrin in those products. So that number is very, very high. This chlorpyrifos is organophosphate. was taken off the market but still shows up, which is interesting. It's not supposed to last that long. All right, so chronic exposures, you know, what I've talked about before is acute. We don't really know. You look at this little thing, it's like there's too many confounding factors. You read a lot of studies. Some, some pesticides are implicated in all these things. So basically, it's back to the guinea pig stage. Uh, we're sort of being used as a guinea pig for these things. And uh, okay, uh, Jerry, this slide is the one where I need you to push on the inside, see if it works. 
this is a little video that um, it may or may may not work. All right, it's not going to work. It's cute. We're working on this thing with Better Kid Care, and we have actual videos for training child care center people about these issues. And it shows these kids like rolling around the floor and sticking everything in their mouth. You know, it's just fabulous. It says more than a million words about how every surface area is a food surface area for a child. So if you put these things into the environment, they're going to put it in their mouth, period. They're going to roll on it. They're going to sleep on it. So um, anyway, there's a whole series of these little short videos. All right, so what's IPM got to do with it and how can it help? Um, first of all, IPM is really an approach. It's not a thing. It's an approach. And it's a stepwise, information-based approach. And the goal of it is to actually control the pests more effectively and more safely. Um, so the IPM methods, I'm just going to talk first about the first part and then the second part, so the highlighted part. You understand the pest identity and you focus on prevention if you can. And then if you have to do something, you use a combination of tactics. And if you need to use chemicals, you use the least risky types of chemicals. How do you know that? People don't know that. So I spend a lot of my time educating. What do you mean least risky? What, if you could only do one thing, what would you do? Stop using aerosols. I'll just tell you that right now. Don't use foggers. Don't use aerosols. Those things get out. Uh, and communication, education, and teamwork, that's what makes the thing work. So it's not a, not a you know, one-man show, so to speak. All right, so it, like I said, it's not rocket science. But you can't, I can't tell you how many times people say, I got bees. I said, you don't have bees. Yes, I do. You have wasps. Well, to them, that, whatever, it can sting me. It's a bee, right? But the way you approach it, IPM is completely different, completely differently. So what it is, where is it, what's its life cycle and needs? Mosquitoes, they live half their life in the water. Well, if you don't put that piece together, you're not going to do adequate IPM for mosquitoes. All right, it's not rocket science. Uh, you find out how many there are and where are they, and how many are too many in this place. That's, it's all situational. It's all prescriptive. And then IPM is pest CSI. You know, pest CSI. Then once you know that stuff, what do you do? You base this on knowledge, not on knee-jerk reaction or, you know, historic like, oh, you know, well, my grandmother always used blah, blah, blah. All right, so uh, we seem to have pyramids. I think Jerry was showing with the pyramids earlier. I kind of equate this instead of to Maslow, who, you know, that kind of scares me. I say this is about like the, like the foo old food pyramid. You want to stay low on the pyramid, all right? So it's kind of green. And these are tactics you can use that are preventative down here. Design and maintenance, building design, communication, planning. We've had a lot of talk about that. Physical, mechanical, keeping pests out with traps, screen, caulking, repairing leaks. Biological, there's some that you can use. Chemical, we divide into different levels of risk depending on the variables. Okay, so we don't just, uh, not chemicals are not one, a one size fits all. Okay, so you keep them out, fix everything, you remove everything that they could eat or could support them. You remove their shelter. This is clutter. Somebody talked about clutter in, in schools and child care a little while ago. So um, clutter is a huge issue. Then you monitor. It's your early warning system. You don't wait for there to be this huge outbreak, and uh, you know, then, you, then your, your hand is forced. You have to do something dramatic, right? This is especially true in the case of bed bugs. People do not want to admit they have bed bugs. They might get evicted. They might be ostracized. Who knows? There's a million reasons why people do not want to say that, and then it gets out of control, and then you're in deep trouble. Stopping one cockroach can do a lot. They reproduce, they actively move around. So get them early, and you get them early by monitoring. All right, uh, once you, you are involved in IPM, you use a combination of appropriate tactics, appropriate tactics, uh, and, and if you need to use chemicals, choose least risky. All right, so what's appropriate? I have this thing about the four Ps. I would like to come up with these things, like, well, so far we're getting by on the three Bs. Bug bombs, bleach, and baits. That's everybody's fallback position. Tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> so the four, the four Ps, uh, IPM takes into account the pests, the people, the place, and the protocols and products that are safe and effective in that place. So for example, if I have a cockroach in the kitchen in a child care center compared to a cockroach in a warehouse out in you know, the back wherever, those are two different situations. Who are the people? Who is the place? What's the pest? The pest is the same, but your protocols and practices may be completely different. 
all right? Monthly spraying is not NOT part of IPM. Uh, okay, so review, we're going into that. We want to talk about, the reason I'm showing that again is I want to talk about this part. I already talked about all the green stuff. That stuff, you know, we know. We have all kind of maintenance lists and things to how to fix and take care of things. What about the chemicals? There's all different types of chemical hazards. Toxicity is one of them, but there's also flammability. The bug bombs can explode, for example. Uh, they're corrosive and reactive, like the bleaches, that kind of thing. Um, there's lots of things going to be wrong. I'm just going to talk about toxicity right now. If you want to reduce risk due to toxicity, that number risk can be reduced by reducing either toxicity or exposure or both. Both being stop using the stuff if you don't need to, all right? But the easiest way, like if you had one take-home message, the easiest way without having to go into any complicated chemical anything and look anything up is to look at the formulation of the product. The formulation is how it's packaged and what form it's in, liquid, solid, that kind of thing. And ask the question before you ever buy it, can this be used without causing exposure? And can it be mistaken for food or drink? A lot of the, the poison control center data was because they are ingested by children in the home. That's the highest, like, you know, 93% was in the home, and I forget all the exact numbers, but it's mostly those things. Uh, kids look at this stuff, it's bright orange, whatever. They're like, dang, that looks great. Glug, glug, okay, there you go. So reduce toxicity, you could choose the less toxic active ingredient, and we'll talk about how to do that. The quickest way is the signal word, which I think is kind of useless in my opinion, um, but it's something, and, or look up the active ingredient. Okay, so the formulation piece, I said how it's mixed, packaged, and presented for sale. Um, it can come in many types of media. It would be ready to use or if you have to mix it. So, for example, concentrates, because you have to mix them, are on automatically more risk because there's more chance of exposure. And I, you know, when I'm, I teach a lot of different people about things, so half the time, I mean, right now I'm sort of chained to this setup, but I'm usually jumping around the room and you demonstrating what happens when you try to mix something and the phone rings and the dog, blah, blah, blah. You know, I mean, accidents happen all the time, be and the risk is inherent in the product because it doesn't take into account human behavior. Um, is it kid-proof? Very few things are kid-proof. So what is in a pesticide? If you want to look at the actives, you have to know a little bit more about this to reduce the toxicity from the actives. So the active ingredient is listed on the front, and there could be any number of other things in there. Uh, only thing we can really know about are the actives and uh, one of the main synergists. We're not really going to know anything about the rest of this stuff. So the most risky formulations I already alluded to, just think about what these mean for people in terms of skin, ingestion, a potential for ingestion. And then, of course, off-label uses. Uh, off-label use is sort of an EPA term that all of us who work in pesticides understand, but what it means is you haven't read the label, or even if you did, you disregarded what the label told you to do. So if the label said, this product is for outdoor use for the control of fill-in-the-blank, you say, well, you know, that must mean it's pretty strong. I'm going to take it inside because those things are coming in, and if some is good, more is better, and... You know, that's off-label use. It's actually illegal to do that. But what I always say to my EPA colleagues, where are the label police then? Because there's nobody, people don't know it's a legal document, and they don't really understand, you know, what's implied by the instructions that are there, like, i.e., it is dangerous. Less risky formulations, self-contained tamper-resistant baits, uh, gels, which come in this tube, which is applied in little dabs and specific desiccating dusts. Some people say dust. Well, dust, dust doesn't mean anything. You could have rose dust, which is notoriously, it's got three different active ingredients, two fungicides and a, an insecticide. So um, dust by itself doesn't mean anything. You have to look specifically what are the actives. So this is another one of these pyramids. You want to stay in the green. Inert dust and powders, meaning they don't have other insecticides added to them, on up like that. Okay, so what about the actual toxicity? You look up the product label on websites. The useful information that you can get off of a product is the active ingredient and the EPA registration number because that actually tags that specific combination formulation of that 
active into that product. And the common chemical name, if any. Those are all very useful things for looking up. Like if you wanted to compare, say, okay, we have to make a decision in our building, in our school district, are we going to use, you know, as a fallback position product A or product B? You can look up the actual information on toxicity. And there's, I gave you on your, on your list uh, resources for how to interpret that stuff and how to look it up on Xtoxnet, which is a great place to get all the chronic, mutagenicity, teratogenicity, because you're not going to get that information on the label. The label's not going to tell you that stuff. So this is why you want to know these things. What the label refers to, the information you can get on the label is acute toxicity. In other words, the one time you know, uh, exposure that may result in illness of some kind. And these, I think you all are probably familiar with this, but I never know, so here you go. Uh, you'll see a signal word, and we have had people talk about signal words, uh, danger, warning, caution, or no signal word, which you know, I guess some of the 25Bs or whatever have that, I'm not sure. Anyway, you don't want danger, obviously. So they always just recommend in, in these places where you want uh, less toxic to go with things that have a caution label. And that's, that is a good like first swipe. You obviously don't want anything with danger, and you prefer not to have anything with warning. And there's very helpful information out of San Francisco on this. So San Francisco has a preferred pesticide list. I'm not sure that's what they call it but something like that, where they've worked over years. The city of San Francisco has an IPM program in place for a long time, and they had to wrestle with which, which products were we going to allow for use. And, you know, pesticide list is not saying, oh, yeah, great, use all this stuff, but it is discriminating between things that are more uh, technically dangerous than others. Um, anyway, I think all of you probably know what LD50 means, but it's a lethal dose at which 50% of the experimental animals die. So I give you all 10 grams, you 20 grams, you 30 grams, and half of you people die, then that's my LD50. Okay, and it's, it's equilibrated to uh, kilogr or milligrams per kilogram of body weight and for a 150-pound human. Now, my problem with these, has an, I have a lot of problem with these, but just to point out a very obvious one, look at the scale of these things. It's like danger is obviously very dangerous, but caution, that's a huge span of uh, milligrams per kilogram of body weight. So not all pesticides are created equal, and even within the warning, these uh, signal words, I don't know how much that helps me. Does it tell me if it's a neurotoxin? No. Does it tell me if it's mutagenic? mutagenic? No. So you have to dig deeper, and you can find that information. It's there. And the active ingredient, just look, look up in some of the places I gave you, and you'll, you'll be able to find that if that's what you need to know. Generally speaking, in broad sweeping generalizations, less acutely toxic, and I underline acutely, you know, we can't answer a question we haven't asked yet. You hear what I'm saying here? Now we're finding out stuff about endocrine disruption and all kinds of other things about the formulation of these products that we didn't know. Why? Because we didn't ask the question. All right, so acutely toxic herbicides and some insecticides, not all insecticides are created equal, see? More acutely toxic, some rodenticides, some insecticides, and some fungicides. So I don't know if this helps you, but it helps you know that you can't assume anything. You have to look. Yes. Yes, there's insecticidal soaps. They're based on potassium fatty acids. It's like soap. Most of the soap that we use in, you know, like the kitchen and whatnot are salt-based, using salt like niacin, or um, not niacin, salt. <laughs> Sodium, thank you. <laughs> you know it's late. I mean, she's sleeping over there. I'm sleeping here. <laughs> We're all like trying to stay up with ourselves here. Sodium-based and the insecticidal soaps are potassium-based. It's the only difference, but it, it the insects, have a, a cuticle on their skin. And what the soap does is dissolve the cuticle and desiccates and dries them out. So it's safe in er than, say, a nerve toxin because of the mode of action is actually physical. It's not toxic. It's a physical degradation of the outside of the insect. We could have a long conversation about these things. It's scary to know too much and not enough at the same time. All right, so what you want to look for is a signal word. You want to look at the active ingredients and directions for use before you ever use it, and of course, special precautions. So this is just a random label. Look for those things. And then the EPA reg number. If it does not have an EPA registration number on it, one of two things is going on. It's either illegal, 
and you should report it to somebody. Or it's in a category called 25B, which similar to what somebody was talking about, I think it was you, was saying about if they disclose all the ingredients, then they don't have to uh, put an EPA reg number on it. So some of the things you see will say, uh, I'm making this up, cinnamon oil, water, and CO2. And sometimes you'll see a product, it has no EPA reg number on it because it's all considered generally regarded as safe contents and they don't have to register it. There's a lot of fighting about that too, but anyway. Anyway, read the label. You know, as best as you can, at least get the information that is there. All right, so put it together. So we're back to, all right, now we learn more about pesticides choosing least toxic. What, what would you do? Put it together. Uh, first is know your pest. What do they want? Where do they live? Blah, 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 just like a chant in school. What do we want? No. Blah, blah. Uh, what if I need to use a chemical? What's the most effective? What's the safest? And what, what are the label directions? Okay. So let's say ants. What do they want? Food. Where do they live? Outside, mostly. What is their life cycle? They have a big colony, and they're feeding a ton of babies, and that's why they're out there looking for food. So they have larvae. How did they get in, and how can I prevent them? Well, they're looking for food, so you know that's why they're there. They nest outside, and they're coming in a crack in the door somehow. Clean up, seal the food, seal the holes, wipe up their trails with soap and water. 99% of the time, you've just solved your nuisance ant problem. You don't have to get your husband or wife on the phone and say, Honey, while you're at Walmart, would you pick up, you're picking up shampoo, would you pick up some bug spray? We have some ants in the house. This takes care of it. What if I need to use a chemical? What's most effective, most safe? Obviously, most safe. Uh, best are enclosed baits. The ants will carry what's inside their back to the colony, and you'll actually kill the colony. Whereas if you just kill the ants walking around on your counter, those are just the foot soldiers. The source has not been dealt with, and the reason they're there has not been dealt with. So more risky and less effective are sprays, and they're risky because you, reduce, uh, you increase uh, exposure possibilities, and also the fact that those, that thing is stored somewhere in your house or wherever, and it doesn't solve the problem. This is just the pattern. You can do this for almost every pest. So tactics for indoor nuisance ants, you can make another one of these. What to do, same thing, but it's specific for ants. Most risky, insecticide sprays and foggers. And of course, that's where um, a lot of people still reside in using the most risky instead of all the things below it that actually solve the problem as opposed to treat the symptom. The analogy with preventive health care is very strong, you know, solving problems as opposed, as opposed to treating symptoms. Cockroaches, what do they want? Where do they live? What's their life cycle? How they get in? How can I prevent them? Same questions. Slightly different answers. They want food and warmth. Depending on the species, there's three sp main species that are pests, which I won't go into. They like to live with you. So cozy. Uh, they have egg cases that they leave all over the place. They have nymphs. So there is such a thing as a baby cockroach. Like there's not such a thing as a baby mosquito, really. There's a mosquito larvae. Anyway, baby cockroaches, they move through cracks and crevices, proper food and trash storage, seal cracks, crevices. You get the picture. What if I need to use a chemical? What's most effective, most safe? Follow label directions. Same thing, enclosed baits, gels, boric acid. Uh, more risky, sprays, bombs. Same thing. Cockroaches, same thing. All right, that, I think those, these are on your handouts, the sheets in the back. Mice, what do they want? Where do they live? What if I need to use a chemical? Here's something, you'll learn something right here. Tiny little things that matter. Uh, rodent poisons are not recommended indoors, partly because of the data you saw from the, from the uh, Poison Control Center. They also die behind the walls and stink, and they attract flies. That's gross enough right there. They're dangerous to children and dogs. A lot of the Poison Control Center calls come from dogs who eat these uh, bait packets. Best are non-chemical controls. Snap traps are best of those because they kill instantly. And um, that's how you set a mouse trap. What do we know about mice? They run back and forth against the wall. If you don't set that trap so it snaps against the wall, you have a 50-50 chance maybe of catching them. And once that thing traps, snaps and didn't catch them, they won't go back. So you want to get it the first time. IPM tactics for mice. 
same thing, higher risk pelleted bait and packets, tracking powders. You don't ever want to see tracking powders anywhere near school. All right, so now I didn't answer all your questions about every pest, but you see where I'm going with that pattern. Those are the questions you ask, and the information's out there. I mean, it is out there. It is not rocket science. You can find this stuff out. Um, challenges in implementing quality pest management facilities. It's an approach, not a product substitution. We are very enamored of products in this country. We want pills and other products to solve our problems. And by God, we'll pay for it. But that's not the way to solve the problem. It requires a plan that must be followed. And you, the critical thing, like if you have one take home message from anything about child cares or other buildings, the vast majority of businesses like child cares, uh, schools and medical facilities contract out their pest control. If you do one thing, and one thing only, contract with a decent IPM pest control operator and communicate with them. It is not just their job to solve your problem. You have to be involved in solving their problem. Yeah. Because if it's not in the contract, they won't follow yeah. that. Yeah. We have model contract. Yeah, we have model contract. Actually, we have a slide that alludes to that if I get that far. All right. So multiple building types. These are challenges. Uh, uh, multiple building types, many older with multiple uses. Many child care centers, unlike in the basement of church. Is that what I have left, Vicki? Yeah. yeah, okay. Um, high turnover of staff. Everybody needs to be trained and a turnover. A lack of control over decisions in the facility. A lot of people express this to me. Like, well, that's not really my decision. I don't have control. I'm, I'm renting this space to run our child care center from, you know, landlord A, and landlord A makes the decisions about what happens in terms of maintenance and pest control in this building. This is particularly difficult in the child care centers because they kind of get into any nook and cranny they can find, and they're not in control of what goes on in that building. They don't have their own facilities maintenance person. All they can do is complain to the landlord, and in many of these are uh, difficult it's difficult to cite your child care center. A lot of people don't want to have you in there because of liability, so you don't want to complain. So there's all these you know, problems that don't have to do with whether or not you know how to do it. It has to do with this, its infrastructure. Uh, and where to get good advice, who you're going to ask, that kind of thing. Most people have relied on quote unquote exterminators and you know, that's, that's fraught. There's a lot of difficulty there. Uh, is your PCO the Lone Ranger? PCO is pest control operator. Uh, I had to do a talk for the Pennsylvania Pest Management Association. Believe you me, that is a dude world. And those guys are, don't want you to talk about anything wrong with their chemicals, right? Now, some of those people are very good, and some of them are not. So I actually showed this to them because it was a picture out of one of their trade magazines. And I thought, you know what? At first, I waffled about this. Like, you know, stand in front of the lion and go, rawr, right? And I showed them this, but then the, I said, I said, this is not you. This is the same image, guy standing with a sprayer. Does it look like the Marlboro Man? I mean, we have all this militarization of our like relationship with nature and insects in particular. You know, show them who's boss. I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> and I said, I said, you are not the Lone Ranger. Instead, I showed a slide. I use a baseball analogy. You know, I, I don't know much about baseball, but I used to play when I was a kid, and I know the part about the pitcher has to decide what kind of pitch to throw to the batter. I said, when you're there and you're, you are a person making decisions based on information, you see that batter and the, and the catcher is telling you, do this, do that, do this, do that, and you're like, no, I don't want to do that. No, 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 ah, I know this batter. I'm going to throw this pitch. Your team player, your toolbox is more than just a hammer. You use information. So, you know, I tried to give a nice guy analogy. I, it, it, it seemed to work. They didn't throw tomatoes at me, you know. They're like, oh, great. So you don't want to work with a person like that. You want to work with somebody who's a team player with you. Like you together are solving this problem. They're giving you information and you're getting information back. So the challenge to reducing risk, they'll go deeper than that. It has to do with every one of us in this room and everybody you know. This is why. Pesticides as solution is the norm. Pesticides are invisible compared to the pests. People are way more afraid of a pest than a pesticide. You know, if it's for sale, it must be safe. And we've always used it, and I'm not dead yet, so, which some of those arguments used to be used with tobacco. And there's another analogy to be made, the way the industry and uh, government are working, quote unquote, together. 
Uh, pesticides are readily available and cheap. And if you live in a poor neighborhood and you can't afford quality pest control, you're going down to Honest Lou's Pest Control on 42nd and Vine, and you're buying a case of foggers when you get bed bugs. That's what you're going to do. Uh, they're not commonly understood to be toxic. Uh, we suffer from many misconceptions and misinformation about uh, reducing risk from pesticides. If you can't smell it, it's safe. The main complaint when people say, well, if you come in and spray for bugs, I don't want to smell it. If some is good, more is better. We all know that one. And if it's for sale, it's safe. We're, we're laboring under these things. And is and then you'll take the next step don't worry about all eight steps at once uh, associated dread is low so for example you may be more afraid of flying because it's a scary thing to fall out of the air in an airplane compared to driving but it's safer to fly than it is to drive right so that was a house in California that got blown up uh, they set off a bunch of foggers for cockroaches and so the house blew up and the cockroaches are saying wow <laughs> We got some good indoor air quality going on in here. <laughs> yeah. We're loving it now. Besides, we're living in California. Okay, there's a new paper out by um, Vicki Leonard's group having to do with uh, the uh, implementation of IPM in child cares. And I like the part where it goes awareness, recognizing the importance, and then look at the next one. If motivated. The reason I spend so much time talking about pesticides and the issues with pesticides is it's sort of like, you know, the iceberg where most of the stuff is under the water. And that's motivating when you say the health of the children is what's important. And the motivating factor is how can we have that histogram with all those pesticide residues? Those are only the ones that they w did together. There were many more. All of those pesticide residues and all those homes and all those child care centers and not care. You know, it's time to get on board with this thing. So the reason I have that if motivated, it's really important for people to understand this is doable and there's a good reason to do it. All right, so this eight steps to an IPM program, this is the part that I can rock it through if I have to since Vicky's over there saying, you have two and a half seconds left. Have eight, minutes. eight minutes, eight steps, okay, let's go. <laughs> right. Uh, you have this stuff on your little thing. It's in our, we have, the PA IPM program has an IPM, t um, IPM for schools, a how-to manual, and it has chapters on every pest, and it has sample policies, and it has, you know, how to make a notification letter for the parents, all that stuff. So there's a ton of resources, but these are the eight steps. Number one, develop and adopt an IPM policy. Designate a coordinator educate staff, implement inspection and pest uh, prevention steps, contract with the right pest control company, can I say that many more times, uh, create an IPM plan to follow, set up procedures for notifying staff and parents, keep records and evaluate results. Okay, that's in a nutshell. These other ones talk about these in a little bit more detail. So what does a policy do? It basically says, thou shalt practice IPM on our school facilities and here's what we mean by it. That's all. It doesn't have to be anything complicated or long-winded. Yes? The question was in Pennsylvania where we have, we have two kind of vague laws about implementing IPM in K through 12 schools. It doesn't include child cares. Um, these laws, unfunded mandates, they come down. People say, how are we going to deal with this? You get a policy put in the Pennsylvania Association of School Board Officials rule book and at least it does something because it's in their policy book so when things happen they have fallback we've had uh, surveys done in Pennsylvania over three different time frames and they are picking up on IPM but it's not very well monitored at all there's no enforcement you know it's complaint driven so it's good to have a law but a law doesn't fix everything a law a law has your back when you walk in there and say hey you know let's talk about IPM they're like why we said because it's a law like really Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, designate the coordinator. IPM is really people management more than anything else. So the IPM coordinator makes sure everybody's communicating who needs to communicate and the, the whole series of steps are followed in, uh, in sequence. There they are. 
So everybody has a role to play. We have done uh, education for all of these different groups. Um, custodial is really important. I just want to mention something about that. On our uh, IPM website at Penn State, we're putting all our PowerPoints on there. Besides pest control operators, talking to custodians is one of the most difficult. They feel particularly downtrodden in some way, like, you know, I, I can't really explain it, but I, f I think they feel like they're at the bottom of the totem pole and they're not taken seriously. And when I talk to custodians, I say, like, look, you, you people are the bedrock of IPM. You people are the most important people in this building as far as IPM goes. You see this building every day inside and out at its very core. <laughs> like, you're the people who are going to, you know, early warning system. You're the people who are going to, um, you know, tell, report things and stuff like that and keep places clean. So anyway, everybody has a role to play and the coordinator makes sure they're working together. Education, I can't say enough about educating everybody. How many school districts have been driven to distraction by some irate parent saying, I want you to spray the school because my kid came home with head lice. I get these calls from people in, in schools and they're saying like, they're telling me, the principal tells me I have to spray because the parent's you know, up his nose about you know, head lice, which of course that's a totally wrong response. I said, if you absolutely have to spray water, tell them you sprayed the school. <laughs> Staff and faculty, do your part, eliminate clutter, report pests, and do not bring in your own bug sprays. I've inspected and done walkthroughs in many, many child cares, and I can tell you today, to date, I have not found one where I did not find a can of Raid somewhere that somebody had brought in from the outside because they were taking things in their own hands, and they have no idea it's illegal. It's Raid, what? It's Raid. What could be wrong with that? And they bring it into schools. Um, so properly store all chemicals and keep a good eye on what's maybe going on with the kids in terms of environmental health. Train everyone. This uh, was one where somebody had found some trash and they left a note to the teacher. Don't leave trash. And then this is a teacher's desk drawer. And it's got a pesticide in it along with some kind of snacks. Hmm. So it's illegal and inadvisable. This is a child care setting. You know, I, I have a million of these pictures, so, you know. Uh, parents and guardians need to learn because uh, they can be the advocates or they can be the thorn in your side for the wrong reason because they're very uptight about what happens with their children, rightfully so, but sometimes they're very ill-informed about what poses a real risk versus what poses a greater risk. So you want to make sure everybody's in the loop and communicating so that they, you don't have these blow-up situations. A uh, good case in point, you want a policy in place before bed bugs come. Bed bugs are going to come. So you want to make sure that you've got it all worked out in your IPM plan, what's your policy and procedures for dealing with bed bug introductions. Uh, inspection, we already talked about that. Make sure everything is in good repair as much as possible. And if you can't fix everything once, of course you can't. Fix the most important thing first. Start with the door sweeps. Francine and Philly is starting with an initiative on asthma uh, initiative, and the focus of that this year is rodents. And so we're working on a whole door sweep policy for all the schools. Door sweeps are not that expensive, and the payback for a good door sweep is huge. So, you know, we don't have to start at the top. Uh, I apologize for the misspellings in this particular slide because it was either really early or really late. But this is one of the child care centers we're working in in Philly. We have a lot of video footage on these inspections that we're going to put together, and they're all kinds of different facilities. But, you know, concentrate on the pest-prone areas. And don't forget the outside. The outside is where they're coming from. So if you're not looking at the outside envelope, then you're missing something. Your maintenance team, make sure you have a maintenance team. And if you don't, train somebody to be the maintenance team. Your custodians are your first line of defense. So you've heard about that before. Make a plan. Make sure you're not caught flat-footed. Just because there's a critter there somewhere doesn't mean you have to nuke it. Just make sure, if you have a place where they're constantly seeing pests, find out why. There's some kind of thing that's happening in that area that requires action. Ask questions of your pest control company. Make sure they do inspections as opposed to just come in and spray. Make sure they're licensed. Make sure they keep records and they give them to you and you look at them. You don't stick them in a drawer and all crumple up like, yeah, I think I have them somewhere. Okay. Create a plan. Set up procedures for notifying staff and parents about these issues. Keep records and evaluate results. Now, what are your action items? 
Do you have a pest management policy for your facility? Do you have one? Do you know what it is? Do you have chronic pest problems? Which ones? Do you have inspection? Do you know what pesticides are applied? Do you have an IPM plan in place? And do you have a communication system in place? This is your action plan. If you don't have any of these things, start with one, and the rest will follow. So my last slides. What's love got to do with it? Aren't they adorable? How can you not care? Everything. I have a teen, this is my Tina Turner, you know, thing I have in my office, you know. And I hope we don't get in trouble with, like, you know, copyright. You guys can take the slide out if you want to. I don't know. Tina, <laughs> Tina don't sue me. <laughs> Implementing IPM in your school. Commitment to quality, safety, health. Thank you.